Good morning, good evening, or good night, depending where you are watching this from, wherever you are in the world. You're most welcome to the second in a series of Health Foundation webinars exploring improvement science, in which we'll be hearing from Dr. Carve Shajania. My name is Bill Lucas. I coordinate the activities of the International Improvement Science Network for the Health Foundation. And today, it is my pleasure and privilege to be interviewing Dr. Shajania. The format of this webinar is that Carve will speak for about 40 minutes. Then he'll take questions for another 20 minutes. Please do let me have your questions and comments as we go through, so I can be ready with really good questions for him and do my best to represent your views. Carve's slides are already visible on the registration website for those who would like to view them. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Carve Shajania. Carve is a hospital-based general internist at the University of Toronto, where he holds a Government of Canada research chair in patient safety and quality improvement. He directs the University of Toronto Centre for Patient Safety. Carve's research focuses on identifying evidence-based patient safety interventions and effective strategies for translating evidence into practice. He's published over 80 peer-reviewed articles in many leading journals. Dr. Shajania has also developed a number of educational initiatives in patient safety, including two websites produced for the US Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which receive approximately 100,000 hits each month, and a best-selling and very well-reviewed book on patient safety for a more general audience. In January 2011, Carve became editor-in-chief of the BMJ Quality and Safety Journal. This journal has the highest impact factor in the fields of quality improvement and patient safety. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm virtual welcome to Carve Shajania. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here, even if it's only virtually. I haven't done a web lecture like this before, not being able to see the faces of the audience. I, I hope it goes well. Uh, I'm sure it will. And again, thank you for having me. Today I'm going to be speaking about how to achieve synergy between the design and evaluation of um, quality improvement projects, but also with their reporting. And importantly, I want to mention that this is not so much based on my role as an editor, um, although it is partly, but um, really on my role locally in working with people who want to develop and implement successful improvement projects. And the more that I've done this over the past 10 years, the more I've been convinced that even though it isn't quite the same as regular research, there are some important design principles that actually help the success of the project, not just making it into a better paper. Before I go on, I want to show this cartoon. I first came across this cartoon when I was preparing a very different talk on patient safety about 10 years ago. But in that time, it's in many ways become the key cartoon for me in quality improvement. Some of you, especially those of you who are at least in their 40s or older, may have heard the expression of Rube Goldberg um, apparatus. Rube Goldberg was a cartoonist during the Depression who became famous for drawing very complicated ways of doing simple things. And this was his pencil sharpener. So as you can see, the pencil sharpener, which doesn't look anything like a pencil sharpener, begins with a window that when you open it, it releases a kite. The kite pulls open a cage of moths. The moths fly out and chew on a coat, which as it becomes lighter, lowers a boot, which flips a switch on an iron, which then starts burning some kind of flannel uh, gown on the ironing board, which smokes out a possum who jumps into a basket which raises the cage on the woodpecker, who can then sharpen the pencil. And if all else fails, there's a pocket knife dangling on the end to sharpen the pencil if the system breaks down. Now, the reason I find this such an instructive cartoon is that in many ways, this is the medication it ordering an administration process in every hospital. It's numerous hospital processes, which have so many steps in them um, starting in one part of the hospital and leading to the bowels of the pharmacy and then pneumatic tubes and transport and porters and so on. And the reason it's such an important cartoon, I think, is that 
No matter how thoughtful a clinician or manager you are, you usually only know a part of the process in your hospital, a part of the relevant process. And so it may seem quite sensible to you to, for instance, just add another woodpecker or change the boot. And you don't realize necessarily that this could have downstream unintended consequences and it will only contribute to the process being even more of a Rube Goldberg apparatus and even more convoluted. And here is a real picture of just adding another woodpecker, so to speak. This was a real patient who was transferred. This was actually a colleague's hospital in San Francisco. They wrote this up as a quote unquote case report. You know, if one wristband is a good idea, maybe five wristbands are a good idea or five woodpeckers, just like with the pencil sharpener. So one of them is the standard patient identification, the white wristband. One of them is a tape allergy. One of them is a serious medication allergy. One of them is a fall risk. And interestingly, they never figured out what, what the yellow one stood for. The patient was a very articulate and intelligent man, and he provided that information. The hospital actually that transferred the patient hadn't provided a legend to say what these different wristbands stood for. My point, though, is, is that the messiness of practice settings makes it very hard to understand the target problems. It's also difficult to attribute the effect of anything you do amidst the noise of randomness and other deliberate changes that are going on in these Rube Goldberg apparatuses that we call healthcare systems. There can be unintended consequences. There are numerous implementation challenges. And making a theory or having a theory for why your intervention ought to work is very helpful as a guide when you're working in such a messy setting. Before I go on with that idea of a theory, I just want to give an example that is a little bit more from my being an editor. This is a typical improvement report as we receive them often. The introduction will say this is an intervention that has something to do with infection control, with hand washing hygiene. And the introduction will say basically that infections are very, very, very important. Um, you could almost just say blah, 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 because it has nothing to do with the actual intervention. It's just the usual talk about why infections are a problem. Then they jump to saying that they had a multifaceted strategy, which is, of course, a, a buzzword, and it is important to have a multifaceted strategy, but we don't really know what any of these ingredients really amount to. The methods briefly state the methods, and then the results are that it doesn't work, and the discussion is we can only guess why. Now, I'm not being entirely facetious. This is quite a typical or representative report. Because we have no idea why this intervention was supposed to work, nor are the details of its ingredients described, nor are any measures of whether the intervention was even implemented successfully, when we're confronted with the simple negative result, we really can't understand what's happened or learn anything for the future. Here's a slightly better report. So with the same topic, instead of saying blah, 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 infections are important, they just jump to the crucial feature, which is that what are the commonly identified barriers to hand hygiene compliance? They include A, B, and C. And then our components of this intervention address specifically A, B, and C by doing X, Y, and Z. The methods provide some details as to what these ingredients really amount to. This time, the results may also say no improvement, but they also say that many patients felt uncomfortable questioning their doctors or nurses about whether they had washed their hands, which was part of the intervention. So in this case, the discussion can say this intervention did not succeed, but we have an idea why, so we can actually learn from this. I want to emphasize that even if they had succeeded in the previous report where they provided none of these details, the success is often implausible. It's an implausibly large effect size, and we don't really know because there are so few details, nor is there any explanation as to why the intervention even ought to have worked, that from a Bayesian perspective, one might say it's, it's just more likely that the study was flawed than that they really had a large impact. So that second report is an improvement. But ideally, and I exp I'm speaking here not as an editor, but as someone who wants to improve things, Ideally, we would have recognized through doing more background work or pilot testing that the intervention had problems, that the theory of the intervention was wrong or incomplete, that the implementation required attention to additional issues, such as in the example I gave, whether patients might feel uncomfortable speaking up when providers walked into the room and may or may not have washed their hands. 
So what I would like to talk about uh, is a view that there has to be a better way to plan interventions and their evaluation so that we increase the chance of success. We don't want to simply produce well-described reports of failure, but we also don't want to produce poor reports of success or failure because we can't learn in either case. Now, the most important concept I want to leave you with is this idea that a good evaluation plan increases the chance of success for the intervention. And that one of the, perhaps the single most important ingredient for that good evaluation plan is having an explicit theory of why the intervention will work. A theory that also includes specifying the active ingredients of the intervention. I mean, we would all agree that it would be absurd to re write a clinical research report that says P patients with diabetes should receive red pills. That would be ludicrous. Often in quality improvement, what we do amounts to something like that. We say that we use a multifaceted intervention and don't really say much more about it. Or if we name what those facets are, local champions, case managers, we don't really say anything more about them. What really is a local champion? Is it just a friend who happened to be willing to donate time? Or is it somebody that you really used a rigorous method to identify as somebody who local clinicians went to for advice and trusted? Um, if you used a case manager, what are some of the features of that case manager and their previous relationship with the people on whom you're intervening? All these things are important details and often we don't know them. And then also, again, we need to embed those details in a theory of exactly why this intervention ought to work. We also need outcomes that measure not just your success or failure, but whether the intervention was even working as expected. If you were doing audit and feedback, did people actually re read your performance reports? That may sound mundane or trivial, but it's a key feature. Often it's difficult to know um, but if you do an audit and feedback study and you don't know if people actually read your performance reports, when the study is negative, you won't know why. You won't know if the basic idea was wrong or if you just needed to address implementation challenges related to delivering the feedback reports. And importantly, you need a framework for refining the intervention and addressing problems as you move. Many people invoke the PDSA cycle and say we did iterative improvements but they don't really have any idea of what they're looking for, what problems or areas of uncertainty there are in their intervention. And it's really important to think about what the unknowns are or the trouble spots are as you begin. So returning to this idea of the importance of a theory, the, the single biggest problem I see, not just as an editor, but as somebody who works with many hospitals in Canada and the United States, with people trying to achieve local improvements <clears throat> is that people often start an improvement without matching the solution to the problem. We'll have a lecture series on the subject or let's develop a clinical practice guideline. Let's do audits and send performance reports. Let's create a new order form or a clinical pathway. The issue is that each of these interventions, some of them may be quite reasonable in certain situations, but the important point is that each of these solutions implies or presupposes a certain type of problem. Obviously, education implies a knowledge problem. Performance reports imply that the problem is largely under the control of the recipients of the reports. Reminders or order sets imply that the problem is maybe memory and that reminding people at the point of care will solve the problem. But often, this is not the dominant problem, or even if it is, there are other ancillary or collateral problems that you need to address as well. And so it's fundamental to characterize the underlying factors that contribute to your target quality problem <clears throat> and make sure that you've designed or chosen an intervention that truly matches that problem. This is a framework that I, no one I don't think has ever written it up. It's, I've used it for some years. It's loosely modeled after the framework that many people will be familiar with from root cause analyses. Excuse me. The idea is that when you're confronted with any quality problem, there could be contributing factors in each of these categories, organizational factors such as staffing or culture or aspects of infrastructure. There could be equipment or human factors issues, various professional issues and patient issues. And I want to illustrate with an example how using this framework can be helpful. 
So overuse of antibiotics for upper respiratory tract infections has been a familiar quality improvement and public health problem for probably 20 years now. Just to be clear, especially for any non-clinicians, we're talking about the idea that people often receive antibiotics for what amounts to a cold and that this is Pub, from a public health perspective, harmful because it leads to overuse of antibiotics and probably contributes to the emergence of resistant organisms. It obviously has economic implications and it also has um, implications for individual patients because they have no chance of deriving benefit from the antibiotics, but they do have a chance of deriving harm. So if we think about what are the potential contributing problems, and we could think about this conceptually and supplement this with knowledge from the literature. So. In this case, it's probably not organizational issues. So for many chronic illnesses, there are organizational issues. You know, the doctor feels that he or she is too busy to take the time in between visits to educate the patient about their medications or fill out all the consults required and whatnot. But in this case, the patient is there with a single problem saying they have a cold and they want you to do something about it. Um, and it really was, is within the power of the doctor to do that without extra staffing. It's probably not memory factors. Again, many chronic illnesses, that is an issue. If a patient comes in with low back pain and you spend the whole visit talking about their low back pain, you could easily forget to ask them about their diabetes and whether or not they've been to the eye doctor in the last year or had their blood pressure checked. But this patient is here basically because they have a cold and they want you to do something about it. Um, attitudes and peer opinion are important contributing factors in many problems. It's, it may be a factor here. It's probably not the dominant one. And knowledge and skills, it does turn out that some doctors think they have some magical clinical acumen that they can identify patients who need antibiotics, but it's probably not the dominant problem. Patient factors, though, in this particular case are probably a dominant problem. The patients expect or want antibiotics, and in fact, this has been very well studied. People have done studies where they wait in the waiting room with patients and ask them why they are there to, for the visit that day, and the patients often say that, I think I need antibiotics. That's a very important reason for my visit. And follow-up questions are, how much do you want antibiotics today? And many patients answer, very much. So interestingly, as an example of matching the solution to the problem, one group of investigators, instead of doing wasted educational efforts directed at the doctors, they directed an intervention at the patients. And they simply randomized the patients to be told different things as to their diagnosis. One group was told they had bronchitis, one group was told they had a viral illness, and one group was told they had a cold. Then they were not given antibiotics and they measured their dissatisfaction. And interestingly, the people who told they had a chest cold were not that dissatisfied when they weren't given antibiotics. The linguistic cue of relating their problem to a cold minimize their dissatisfaction because they know you don't need an antibiotics for a cold. So if they have a chest cold, well, that sounds okay to them. If they're told they have bronchitis though, well, that sounds a little bit more like it needs antibiotics. Interestingly, a viral illness was in between. I, I personally find that amusing because so often physicians do tell patients in an effort to reassure them that they just have a viral illness, don't worry about it. But patients have really only ever heard of HIV, Ebola virus, and other quite nasty viral illnesses. So it's not clear why they should actually be reassured by that. So maybe that's why it had the intermediate result of being somewhat dissatisfied. But the point is that in this case, the investigators were matching their solution to the underlying problem that patients expect to receive antibiotics and your intervention needs to address that issue of patient expectations. A colleague of mine uses this cartoon on the importance of understanding behavior, showing an anthropologist or scientist interviewing penguins who say that all we eat is fish, fish has no fiber, we're all constipated, and that's why we walk funny. So sometimes you really do need to talk to the patients or the doctors, and, if, and when people have done that in the case of overuse of antibiotics, they have clearly indicated that patients expect to receive antibiotics and providers need tools to deal with that expectation. So I want to give an example of more of successfully matching the solution to the problem, reduction of nosocomial urinary tract uh, infections. So for any of you who work in a hospital setting know that 
um, overuse of, in North America, they're called Foley catheters. I suppose the more general term is indwelling bladder catheters. This is the huge contributing factor to nosocomial, nosocomial bladder infections. They are hugely overused. Uh, approximately 20% of hospitalized patients have one of these catheters. In, and the in, insertion of the catheter is not indicated about 25% of the time. But importantly, they're often placed in the emergency department before a physician even sees the patient. The continued use of the catheter is often not indicated. But importantly, many physicians just forget to check every day, especially if they're not a urologist. They forget to check if their patient has an indwelling catheter. The important point here is that education directed at physicians, reminding them of the importance of checking their patients for catheters and the indications for catheters and so on are likely to be ineffective. So one group of investigators tried this intervention of automatic stop orders for urinary catheters. The idea is that if so many doctors are not even aware of their patients having catheters, <clears throat> well, why not just remove them? And so what they did is that when patients arrived on the floor, they, if they had a catheter, the nurse put an automatic order on the chart or in the computer system, it's been done in both types of settings, that said that the catheter should rem be removed in 72 hours unless the doctor overrides the order. And they were able to show that they reduced catheter duration by three days, which in addition to any infectious implications, also makes patients happier and contributes to their mobility because many elderly patients find it difficult to mobilize while they have an indwelling catheter. I'm not gonna go over the 10 specific steps that I often lecture on in, in this setting, and actually we will be having a paper on this in our journal outlining 10 specific steps to consider that achieve synergy between the design of your intervention and its reporting. But I will highlight a few of them and the first two are related to just what I've been talking about in these last few slides, which is having an explicit theory for why your intervention should work and also specifying the active ingredients of your intervention. And think about it analogous to any clinical intervention. What are the dose and intensity of your ingredients? How frequently should performance feedback occur? And in what format? Should it be in person? Should it be by a letter? How often should nurses screen for fall risks? or ask about any factors that you want nurses to ask patients about. Should it be just at admission or should it be every few days? And as I said, match these ingredients to the specific causes of your target problem. I wanna emphasize, just before I finish on this subject of theory, that theory aids not just in the design of your intervention, not, not just in the eventual report, but in the design of your intervention. Sometimes you may realize that you shouldn't even pursue this intervention. So for instance, if you ask as many people submit um, or in, in, undertake a fall reduction intervention, and screening for fall risk is a common approach. So if you ask, well, why will screening for fall risk work? Well, someone might say, because if we identify the subset of high risk patients, then we can focus on them. That seems sensible. But then the next question is, can you identify a subset of high risk patients? And in most, in many settings, people will say actually most patients end up being high risk. So obviously that's not particularly promising and you would really want to refine your intervention before you even got going. Bed alarms are another um, commonly talked about intervention, the idea that there would be an alarm that goes off when the patient gets out of bed. If you ask the question, how will bed alarms reduce falls? Well, you might facetiously answer because nurses love nothing better than more alarms going off. And if hospitals outside of North America or anyone, anything like the ones I've worked at in North America, I'm obviously joking here because we already have so many alarms going off and a real problem with nurses having alarm fatigue. So this, this facetious answer really underscores that this isn't necessarily a promising intervention. It's supposed to work by having another alarm going off for nurses to feel frustrated about. In addition to having one theory, just like in any good science, having an alternate theory can be even better. I'll use the example of medical emergency teams. Now, medical emergency teams have been sort of flogged in the debates about quality improvement because of the conflicting evidence and conflicting enthusiasm that some people have about this. I want to emphasize I'm not contributing to that debate here. I've worked in some hospitals where, me where <clears throat> medical emergency teams seem to be wonderful, 
I've worked in others where they seem like they may not really be achieving a desired impact, and certainly the literature gives examples of both. And it may be that, in fact, it works well in some places and not in others. But for now, I just want to emphasize that when you're undertaking one locally or when you're thinking about one that's being reported in a, in a journal article, it's important to realize that there are different reasons that this, this intervention might work. The main theory has been traditionally that deteriorating ward patients are often not recognized early enough and ward physicians are often difficult to reach and even when they are reached, they don't escalate care in a timely enough fashion. But there are other contributing factors or theories that I've seen in action anecdotally and people have talked about in the literature. One is that the transfers to intensive care units are often delayed when ward staff have to fight with overworked critical care staff. But when the rapid response team or medical emergency team is in fact consisted of people from the intensive care unit, it may facilitate the transfers. And another issue is that the medical emergency teams may make more patients do not resuscitate, which leads to fewer unexpected deaths, and it may improve the quality of end-of-life care, but it's obviously a very different thing than saving critically ill patients. And the important issue is that the specification of these different theories directly suggests different outcomes worth measuring, and it also suggests that as you're refining your implementation, you may see that each of these theories has an element of truth and you may need different ingredients for your intervention, for your medical emergency team, to optimize its impact. And the last example I'll give is a local example I'm dealing with right now, but some of you may be familiar with this sort of intervention already, depending on where you practice. <clears throat> and that is an, uh, the idea of a renewed interest in house calls, especially for frail, homebound elderly patients who find it difficult to make it to their appointments or their families find difficult to get them there. This is certainly an intuitively sensible intervention, but consider two types of patients. One is a homebound patient with multiple chronic problems who's quite frail and frequently has acute problems such as a urinary tract intervention or delirium from a new medication. That patient would probably benefit from rapid access to care via a house calls program. But there are other patients who are homebound with multiple chronic problems but are relatively stable. They may be gradually deteriorating, possibly from Alzheimer's, possibly from arthritis, or some underlying condition, but they don't really have frequent acute problems. What they really need is to be seen on a regular basis every couple of months and have a mechanism for transporting them comfortably and reliably to their appointments. In that case, regular visits with some sort of transportation support is probably sufficient and more cost effective than house calls. So the important point here is that as one thinks through the theory of why house calls for homebound elderlies work, one realizes that to achieve maximal impact in a cost effective manner, one really needs to know if one can distinguish these different types of patients because targeting them may be crucial for developing this intervention and showing it to be cost effective. So in summary, thinking through the theory of an intervention enhances patient selection. It sharpens your thinking about what types of patients will most benefit from the intervention. It allows you to think about whether you have the key ingredients. You may realize that you're missing some. So for instance, for house calls, it may be that for many patients or their family members, having someone available by telephone relatively instantly to reassure the patient or their family may be all that's needed and that allowing for that possibility may be more important than attempting to deliver urgent home calls for everybody. The theory will also sharpen your evaluation. Articulating the mechanism for the intervention will facilitate your choice of outcomes and it will also allow you to recognize key contextual factors. And you know what, I'm actually going to skip through this slide in the interest of time, but basically as many people have heard, context is becoming an increasingly um, discussed topic in quality improvement. And the idea is that we now have a long list of potential contextual factors that might affect any given intervention. And there's no real way of selecting from those contextual factors in terms of what's most relevant to your intervention unless you have some theory for how the intervention is working. So just like in regular clinical research, where we select which factors are worth reporting, for instance, the gender or the age, we might always report, but whether the patient smokes 
or when their last heart attack is or what their socioeconomic status is. We don't always report all of those things. We base them on what the study is about. And in the same way in quality improvement, we can't report every single theoretically possible contextual factor. We have to think about the theoretically possible ones with this particular intervention based on why it's supposed to work. I want to briefly speak <coughs> about the idea of evidence. And I don't mean the evidence for the effectiveness of intervention necessarily, but an often overlooked issue, which is evidence that relates to some of the aspects of your intervention. So to give an example, um, chronic congestive heart failure disease management programs um, are very popular, just as diabetes disease management programs are, kidney failure disease management programs, and so on. So imagine a fairly generic uh, heart failure disease management program that involved implementation of some kind of evidence-based protocols for choosing medications and so on, a protocols for adjusting medications based on patients' reported symptoms, and the mechanism for adjusting those medications is delivered through frequent telephone calls using an automated response system, which is becoming increasingly popular, at least in North America, where patients get an automated telephone call and there's an option, a very simple option, for them to say that they have any symptom of, of interest and then somebody phones them back, usually within 12 to 24 hours. So in this case, the ingredients are fairly clear. The theory is not hard to guess from the description, and there's such a huge literature on disease management programs. But in terms of evidence, well, there was a large trial in the New England Journal last year, a large well-designed randomized trial evaluating a disease management program for heart failure with daily telephone contact with patients. And importantly, the results showed that there was no difference in either the primary or secondary endpoints, and the, the primary endpoint was readmission to the hospital or death from any cause within six months, which is a standard endpoint for heart failure studies. And there were a number of secondary endpoints. They were all quite reasonable. Well, importantly, the results showed that patients used the telephone system as the investigators intended, so it wasn't a failed implementation. They also showed no subgroups that had any important effect either. So the idea, my point here is that this, this trial is very sobering for anybody who wants to deliver a disease management program involving telephone contact, certainly automated telephone calls. And it's an example, illustrative example of why going to the literature sometimes about specific components of your intervention can be very useful. Here's another example that I encountered locally when I was working with a number of nurses at a very a prestigious teaching hospital who were engaged in trying to implement um, got uh, practices for screening for domestic violence in the emergency department. This is a widely recommended practice and the provincial college of nurses was recommending that nurses undertake these activities. After I'd been talking to them for a while, <clears throat> I decided to go home and do a quick literature search and I simply entered the following free text words into the PubMed, free PubMed search algorithm from the National Library of Medicine. And when I did that, I retrieved just two articles, but one of them was a randomized control trial from JAMA from just a couple of years ago. And what this trial on screening for intimate partner violence was, it actually took place here in Ontario, which is where the nurses I was talking to also practiced. It was a very well-designed randomized control trial in a number of settings. And the bottom line was that it didn't work. Now, this is very sobering, and it obviously should make anyone think twice about undertaking this if they don't have a lot of resources. And importantly, when I clicked the related articles, I found another study that showed that women preferred certain approaches to screening for domestic violence over other approaches. They preferred completing on their own some questionnaires versus face-to-face -face questioning. And I've worked in many emergency departments that do the face-to-face -face approach. My simple point here is that most interventions have been tried before. You may find important information on the likely effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of what you're undertaking, or previous work may suggest specific refinements to your intervention. Also, the components of your intervention may have been studied in analogous situations. So the telephone contact and heart failure example may apply to other disease management interventions, even if they're not about heart failure. 
the point is simply that don't ignore this work. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Of course you're going to try to do PDSA cycles, but save yourself a few PDSA cycles by learning from what other people have written about in similar situations. Another practical point that comes up but is often ignored, it may seem like a very research-oriented point, but it's hugely practical, is that many people think that their outcomes will improve in a timeline that's convenient to them but actually is not driven by the underlying situation. So somebody may be told that the hospital wants this project done in a year, so they do a before-after study where they have six months before and six months after. But the reality is that the outcome of interest doesn't care what the hospital management said. It just may not improve in six months. One of the reasons it may not improve that quickly is that the intervention may not be like a light switch that gets turned on. It may take a number of months to reach optimal effectiveness. It may be that a number of other intervening things must improve before the ultimate outcome of interest improves. And there's even situations where the outcome of interest may initially worsen. Uh, two examples where I've come across this anecdotally are patient satisfaction and also staff culture. So in either case, you could imagine that if you are engaged in an intervention to improve patient-centeredness or patient satisfaction, it involves educating patients about their care, once they're sensitized to important issues, they may realize that the care they're receiving is in fact very unsatisfying. Similarly, if you are trying to improve staff culture, you may staff may realize that they live in a very poor culture, and before you can improve things, they may actually start reporting worse results. If you don't know to expect that, you may abandon your intervention and be disheartened when you needn't do that. Here's a very concrete example of that situation. This was an example from the UK where pharmacists were going into the home to visit patients and look through their medication and remove out-of-date prescriptions and form general practitioners of drug reactions and a number of other things that ought to improve care. What they found was that the intervention was associated with a significant higher rate of hospital admissions and did not significantly improve any of their other quality metrics. Now, in hindsight, this was predictable. If there's a lot of unknown quality problems with medications in patients' homes that no one has known about, if you have a trained professional like a pharmacist going into their homes, their initial reaction will be alarm and they will send these patients to the emergency department. Eventually, this will likely improve care, but if you don't expect this initial possible decrease, that then you may abandon the intervention unnecessarily. I'm going to skip through, as I said, we're going to have a full article on this topic. The next two steps I'm just going to briefly allude to, which is the idea of thinking about a framework for what you need to look for as you're refining your intervention iteratively. You need to include outcomes that assess whether the intervention is working as you expect or the fidelity of the implementation in order to identify implementation issues. For instance, how often did patients use the phone system in that heart failure study? Or if you used audit and feedback, were people reading the performance reports you sent? You may also realize that your theory for the intervention was incomplete, and you may need to augment the intervention. But I do want to talk about unintended consequences. Frequently in patient safety and in quality improvement, what we're trying to do actually creates negative side effects, sometimes even the opposite of what we're trying to do, sometimes collateral unintended consequences. One of my per there's numerous technological examples that many people will be afraid of. One of my per personal favorite examples is actually a non-technological intervention, and that is examining the safety of patients isolated for infection control. These investigators found that isolated patients were twice as likely to experience adverse events, which is, many of you know, that's the major outcome in patient safety studies. It indicates bad things that happen to patients from their medical care rather than from their underlying disease. Now, their study wasn't designed to prove why they were more likely to experience adverse events, but it is noteworthy that they also found that isolated patients were more likely to have no vital signs recorded and have, no day, have days with no physician progress notes. And as a clinician myself, I will admit that sometimes 
It may be very hot out on a summer day. You've already been in to see a number of isolated patients and the thought of getting a gown on all over again is a little bit unpleasant. And so frankly, sometimes it's tempting to just go to the door of the room and ask the patient how they're feeling today. And if they say they're feeling fine, they don't get examined. And nurses may be doing the same thing too. The point is, is that this is an unintended consequence. Of, of course, I'm not suggesting that infection control practices be abandoned. I'm simply pointing out that even well-intentioned and even evidence-based interventions can have unintended consequences. And if we're not careful to measure those consequences, we may not realize that the net, what the net benefit is or lack of benefit as the intervention is being implemented. There are numerous other unintended consequences um, with computerized order entry, electronic medical records, and numerous other examples. I'm going to more or less wrap up here and just say that the eighth step is really traditional methodologic questions. That's really a talk in itself. And so I will simply say for this talk that every project has an Achilles heel. And you need to ask how your design choices deal with that Achilles heel. Are secular trends an issue? Might the intervention take a while to achieve maximal effectiveness? Is your primary outcome valid? Does your outcome really tell a story? And will you be able to say anything useful if the intervention doesn't work? I have a slide here with common problems for outcomes, but I'm going to skip through that because I really want to wrap things up and leave time for questions. The last two steps I have here have to do with spreading the intervention, but I know most of you will really be care, care about it, the initial step of just getting the intervention to work in your own hospital. And so with that, I will say um, thank you very much for your attention, that in summary, I've, I've talked about considering steps that will increase the chance of success for quality improvement projects, and that attention to these elements will substantially enhance your writing and success in publication. And with that, I'll turn things over to Bill and in case he has any questions from the audience. Thank you very much for your attention. Carve, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I do have some questions for you. Uh, let me start with the first one. Um, and it's this. Uh, what tools and approaches are recommended for understanding the root cause of a problem and who to involve within this scoping work? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the framework that I outlined in this talk is useful, but it is fairly superficial. Uh, but it, you know, it, it really takes the a human factors approach to understanding quality problems, recognizing that there are categories of organizational problems, individual problems, equipment problems, and so on. I think that understanding the problem usually often involves a, a process mapping, which is something that many people might be familiar with if they've done any work with um, so-called lean improvement. Um, as I uh, outlined with that Rube Goldberg apparatus at the beginning, the problem is, is that even the most thoughtful and experienced clinician, and even clinicians who also have knowledge of quality improvement, won't understand truly the overall process that they're trying to intervene on. And so usually you will need a multidisciplinary team, often including someone with experience in process mapping and human factors work to help characterize the underlying problem. Although I will say that often most quality problems have been studied to some extent and that should be supplemented with some literature searching as well. Thank you, Carve. And this is really a, a comment for all our, our watchers and listeners. If there's anything you'd like to ask, uh, Carve, now's your, now's your chance to ask him. Um, and I have another question here, which is, uh, Carve, what is your opinion of the Squire guidelines? Uh, I am a huge supporter of the Squire guidelines. Um, and I was consulted by a number of the people who, who wrote those guidelines. But the Squire people themselves recognize that they need a new version of the Squire. I think what Squire did that was hugely important was create general recognition even outside the quality improvement world, for instance, in major general medical journals and so on, that improvement reports aren't the same as clinical research, that they have unique elements. Although realistically, the Squire guidelines, they really just touch the surface. And I think the people who um, designed them would recognize that you, know, you can't make it perfect. Um, you can't overwhelm people, too, with too much new information the first time out of the blocks. So I think some of the important elements the Squire guidelines did include were attention to the contextual factors, attention to the motivation for the intervention, 
um, and so on. But I think that the next version, which is being worked on, I think as we speak, and I know many of the people involved, will have more attention to the theory for the intervention, which is one of the things that I've been highlighting, and a number of the other factors that I'm talking about. I want to emphasize that I don't think anything I'm saying contradicts the Squire guidelines. I think the Squire guidelines are just ready for the next version, and probably a number of the elements that I've been talking about will find their way or be complementary to the Squire guidelines next version. Thank you. Um, Carve, listening to you, um, I'm just wondering where what you've been saying fits into this uh, debate that's, uh, that's uh, of interest to uh, improvement science scholars and practitioners about uh, the difference between a rigorous randomized trial and the necessary more expeditious designs that you might adopt to, uh, to make improvement happen quickly. Could you say a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, I want to emphasize, so I was one of the people involved in those debates and often sort of was vigorously or passionately debating with the other people and I was seen as the one who was sort of more for rigor. It's, my thinking has sort of changed, but then I think so of the other people's thinking changed too. I think that there was necessarily a passionate debate uh, between people who wanted to move forward and improve things and other people who wanted to say, look, quality improvement isn't different than anything else that has a pressing public health or clinical need. We don't rush into cancer drugs or HIV drugs because we sometimes get it wrong. So why should we do the same thing with quality improvement? I want to emphasize that I think both sides realize that there's a middle ground now. And that's why I really steered away in this talk from talking about randomized trials or non-randomized trials. The issue is really about coming up with an evaluation plan that actually addresses the unique issues of your project. And that's why I've also emphasized that it really will improve the success of your project, not just the rigorous evaluation. So that I think the key thing that I now acknowledge that I may have been wrong about before is that in traditional clinical research, the people doing the evaluation have no vested interest in whether the intervention works. It's just as it's fine with them if they do a rigorous evaluation and shows that some pill of interest and widespread use turns out not to work. But in quality improvement, because of the scarce resources for this, we really want these things to work. So we don't want to bias our evaluations, but we do want the people doing the evaluating to have more of a collaborative role with the people doing the implementation. And so that's why I really think it's crucial to achieve a kind of a balance between thinking about your th your intervention as something that needs an evaluation, because of course you won't know if you succeeded, but thinking about that up front, using some of these research-oriented principles, I really do think they will help not just achieve the eventual paper or report that might come out, but will actually improve the, the likelihood of your succeeding. And we really are seeing this time and time again that even the people with whom I formally debated about this subject, I think would acknowledge that too often we see reports where you really can't learn anything from them and they're just failed efforts. And that's what, what I've been talking about seeks to address. It seeks to address the problem of failed efforts and so that they'll be less likely to fail, but also that we can learn from something when they fail, because that's the other problem that comes up too. Thank you. Uh, a different tack now, Kave. Uh This is a question about uh, training and uh, training uh, and teaching future clinicians. And it's a question that says, uh, uh, given the importance of this, uh, what do you know about uh, most effective techniques for teaching clinicians and uh, what are the most successful programs you have seen that might be of interest to others? Uh, that's a topic that's of interest to a lot of people right now because I think uh, it's, a okay, it's a complicated topic. I guess I want to first point out that I think there's two important categories of people who are contributing to improvement work. And um, uh, actually a colleague and I wrote a little bit about this in a JAMA commentary a couple years ago on this as a new career pathway in academic medicine. The first group is the traditional researcher who happens to study quality improvement. These people typically have had advanced training, master's or PhD level in the methods of clinical research or health services research, they're skilled statisticians or trialists or what have you, and they simply have been bitten by the quality bug from early on, and that's been their research topic. And as they've become successful, they may have collaborated more with other researchers from the social sciences and so on, but they're really traditional researchers. 
And then there's another important group, though, who are more local innovators. But often, there, you know, these improvements require complex thought. You can't just effortlessly implement even something as apparently simple as a surgical checklist, and certainly not something like a computerized order entry system. For this first group, I think what we're seeing, the traditional researcher, is that at large academic medical centers, what we're seeing, the, the really successful groups, is that there's enough mentors at those places that even if they have a relatively traditional training program, their exposure to mentors, whether they're people like in the UK, I don't, it sort of feels strange to name names, but someone like Charles Vincent at, the, at Imperial College or in you know, the United States, someone like Peter Pronovost at Hopkins or David Bates at the Brigham or whoever it may be, um, that you know, if you have enough of those people, any traditional research program is probably okay, especially if you open your doors to the social sciences, engineering and so on. But I do think that some of these places we're also seeing the development of more deliberately designed programs where people are trying to engineer that type of multidisciplinary training and you know really right now that's just starting to happen and it involves you know the thoughtful design of the curriculum it involves figuring out a way to bring people together who don't normally work together but often no matter how much you try to design these things they really develop organically often around somebody's original research program that started to develop nice connections with people in other departments and disciplines and there are a handful of those in North America and in Europe um, again and one doesn't like to name names but I actually have always been impressed by some of the things that have gone on in Holland with Richard Grohl's group and I think now Michael Wensing where they've got such a critical mass of people but there are a number of places in the UK and in North America now too where there's a critical mass of people doing this work and they're now also designing graduate programs that explicitly address improvement science and I think that's going to be the way of the future. Thank you for that Kave and I know that the Health Foundation Improvement Science Network is actively scanning centers across the world and will be in a position to publish something uh, in the spring. Uh, you, met, you touched on Imperial here in uh, London and there's a really nice question now, a topical question too, uh, Carve, it's uh, do you have any tips on how to incorporate economic analysis into improvement science and quality improvement work? It seems in today's financial climate particularly important to be able to show that improving quality can also sure. save money. That's a huge question everywhere. We actually have a couple of um, systematic reviews and economic analyses coming out on this topic in the journal, and that will, they won't be the last word on this subject by any stretch. Um, I mean, uh, I will say my initial reaction sometimes is a little bit facetious or tongue-in-cheek, and that is that if you want to do cost-effectiveness analysis, you have to have something effective first. And unfortunately, there haven't been that many effective things in improvement science or patient safety. So the fact that there hasn't been much cost effectiveness is almost neither here nor there. That said, we are obviously starting to find some effective things. And so we do need to do some serious economic analyses. I think there are a number of challenges. There are some things that are unique about, for, so for the first challenge is that many of the people working in this area don't collaborate with people with any sophisticated economic background. So often people will do a very superficial or unsophisticated cost counting where they simply just basically do a, almost like a budget report. Um, and that's not adequate for a number of reasons. It doesn't usually take into all, a lot of subtle costs nor subtle benefits either. There are also complicated issues about, you know, just to take one example, you know, somebody having their leg amputated from their diabetes is not the same as somebody having their leg amputated because the wrong leg was cut off. So there are also complicated issues about how we value things too when error is involved. But to make a long story short, I think that's going to be the next important frontier in quality improvement is adding sophisticated cost effectiveness. And one of the basic qu problems that will also come up though is which perspective to take. And the perspective to take isn't always obvious. You know, the standard perspective in cost in economic analysis is a societal perspective. In the UK and even in Canada to some extent, that may be reasonable, but in the United States, for instance, often it's going to be the single hospital's perspective. Are they going to save money by preventing adverse events? That's a very different question than whether society will be better off. And so 
I think, again, cost effectiveness analyses have to happen. I think that we often don't capture the costs adequately, nor do we do the analyses adequately, and we don't even think adequately about the perspective. But on the other hand, as I said, it probably hasn't mattered so far because we haven't had that many effective things to even do economic analyses for. Thanks. That's a lovely distinction, that, uh, Cave. Now, we now uh, jump to the other side of the Atlantic, and we're in Boston at the uh, Institute of Healthcare Improvement. And a nice question here, just uh, uh, inviting you to say a little bit about the process by which you uh, and your collaborators arrived at the 10 steps for achieving synergy. You, you, uh, for obvious reasons, you, you went through them in, 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 at some speed, but we'd love just to see inside your mind there about how you got there. Oh, I will have to freely acknowledge that this was um, informal in the sense that, oh, so real, I mean, that's why I'm not claiming this is going to be the next Squire guidelines. Um, and the paper I was alluding to is really more of a, you know, a review article. But I want to emphasize that this is um, based on the colleagues I'm writing this with are experts on program evaluation, which I know is something that many people in quality improvement have become interested in, the so-called realist evaluation and so on. The program evaluation I do think provides a useful model. I mean, I'm not specifically endorsing Pawson and Tilly's realist evaluation or anything, but I just think the general um, field of program evaluation does represent a nice um, tradition of the the balancing between the practical issues of making messy um, interventions in messy settings, often in social settings, um, whereas healthcare is not social but it's equally messy, and having a balance between some kind of evaluation plan and an implementation plan. Many of these principles are also found in other people's work, um, so and I, and I really do draw on practical examples. So and and my own work right now involves, uh, for instance, you know. We're working with the government of Ontario to evaluate a number of, of, of interventions they want to roll out, and I work with colleagues who do similar things in other jurisdictions. And these things come up over and over again, like lack of attention to these principles. And so partly in my role as an editor, partly as a researcher, partly in collaboration with other experts who've done this type of work. But the Squire guidelines, when they get revamped, those will be a more formal consensus um, process where experts are interviewed, literature is reviewed, and so on. And that's why I wouldn't at all suggest that what I'm saying should replace the Squire guidelines. I think it's complementary to it, and I think Squire version 2.0 will probably have a number of these elements in it. Thank you. Um, Kaveh, we're nearly, we're nearly there. Um, and with your role as a distinguished editor now, I wonder if you might... Uh, well, first of all, there's one specific question, and then I think you've, uh, you have a few uh, tips, really, for uh, anybody considering uh, publishing in this area. And I guess the opening question would be something like, um, given what you've been saying, how likely are these uh, improvement science kind of reports going to be uh, finding their way into high-impact uh, quality journals of the kind that you edit? And uh, what advice might you have to anybody sitting here and uh, watching? Sure. Well, I think that uh, I have been very sensitive to this issue, and I really think that we have accommodated people who have needed to provide um, information, content, or format in a non-traditional way. So th what we find is that it isn't the format of the article that interferes with a lot of these reports. It's that they didn't pay attention to the issues, and then it's too late when they want to write them up. If they did pay attention to these issues, then we have had a number of examples where we say, we are so glad to hear that you did all this work. It reassured us as editors, and the reviewers were then able to judge your manuscript. We're going to put it in an online appendix, though, so that we're reassured, for instance, that you did all this initial pilot testing, or that this was how you validated this outcome, or that this is a more complete description of what exactly your performance reports looked like or your educational intervention. And you can simply state that and briefly in the article, and then there will be an online appendix. So I have found that the format of the articles has not been as much as a barrier as some people may think. We've also been quite generous on the length, quite frankly. I know that if you try to submit something to the BMJ or the New England Journal of Medicine, obviously you often are working with a 2,500-word limit. 
we often have articles now that are three to four thousand words and we are more generous though so please do not start sending me long articles everybody <laughs> uh, but especially for quali especially for qualitative research and other more complex designs we have been much more generous with space with the use of online appendices and then frankly um, and this gets into the writing tips a lot of times your initial goal is just to convince the reviewers and the editors and then we can obviously shorten the format and so on Kelvay, that's been really exhilarating. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we've come to the end of the time now. I know you're uh, very I happy realize. to continue. Uh, but thank you. Um, thank you, especially to all of you, for taking part in this uh, stimulating debate. Uh, lots of questions I didn't manage to get to. Uh, and thank you for those, and we'll do our very best to answer them. A reminder that uh, Carve's slides are on the registration site right now, and uh, this webinar itself will be on the Health Foundation's site shortly. Looking ahead, I'm delighted to announce that the next in our series of webinars will be given by Dr. Frank Davidoff. Dr. Davidoff uh, has a distinguished history of innovation in the field of improvement science and is a member of the Health Foundation Improvement Science International Network. His talk will take place on Thursday, the 29th of March, and Dr. Davidoff will be exploring the topic of heterogeneity in improvement science. Much more details of his webinar will be posted on the Health Foundation website. But finally, and most importantly, our, our sincere thanks to Dr. Kave Shajania for his most extraordinary stimulating webinar. Thank you, and goodbye.